man, this biostat stuff is confusing. I don't get it. I don't get it. Confounders, precision variables, mediators. These are different roles that variables may play. It's your bread and butter, baby, 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 what's your jam? Now I get it. Greetings, Bio 6611. In this lecture, we're going to introduce the roles that variables in multiple linear regression can play including confounders and precision variables to start with. We'll first introduce confounding and then end with precision. A common use of multiple regression models in the health sciences is to adjust for an association for the effects of what we call confounding variables. The idea of confounding is that there is a distortion of the estimated association due to the effects of other variables. For example, a confounder C would be what we think of as the variable that's causing this distortion between our outcome y and our primary explanatory variable of interest x. To help classify confounding, we're going to introduce two different sets of criteria one can use after introducing a little bit of background and terminology. So first we have this idea of a crude or what some people call an unadjusted estimate. This is the association of that primary explanatory variable or PEV our x variable of interest with the outcome y. And this is a crude estimate when we exclude those confounders from the model. The converse of this is an adjusted model, which is the association of x and y, when we also account for c in our model. One common way of representing this type of information is what we call a DAG, or a directed acyclic graph. We can see here in the figure what we have is this estimate of x going to y, and so we're saying there's some relationship or an association that we think might be there for x that would affect the outcome. For a confounder c though, we think that there might be also some information coming from the confounder that affects both the primary explanatory variable of interest and our outcome. The directions of the arrows help us to show the relationship and the directionality that we expect or hypothesize is occurring. From our DAG we can define three models of interest that will be helpful in evaluating the potential confounder C. One is a crude model, which we take our outcome Y, and we fit a regression model with just our primary explanatory variable of interest, X. In the second model, the adjusted, we have both X and C as predictors in the model. The third and final model that we will use of, to evaluate potential confounding is a covariate model, and in this case we make C an outcome instead of y, but we still use x as our predictor. We'll use these three models to evaluate potential confounders. The first set of criteria for confounding is what we call the classical criteria. There's three different considerations to make in evaluating in this context. The first is that a confounding factor must be associated with the exposure or that primary explanatory variable of interest that we're studying. From our three models, this would be the association of x and c uh, represented by gamma hat x on the previous slide. The second criterion is a confounding factor must be a risk factor or a surrogate for a risk factor for the disease. From our three models on the last slide, this would be the association of c and y given x represented by beta hat sub c. Third, a confounding factor must not be affected by the exposure or the disease. One thing we also should stress is that a confounding factor cannot be an intermediate step in the causal path between the exposure and the disease. In this case, we would have what we call a mediator, which we will discuss in the next lecture. In addition to the classical criterion, we have the operational criterion for confounding. This is one where we can evaluate the beta hat crude and beta hat adjusted estimates to determine if confounding is present. If there is a meaningful difference between those two uh, predicted values for beta hat crude and beta hat adjusted, we would say that there is some confounding introduced by that C covariate. However, meaningful is somewhat subjective. And in fact, if we can't rely on the context of the problem where we don't have enough information, we may have to calculate something like a percent change or difference in one of two ways. One way is favored by biostatistician, and another tends to be favored by epidemiologists, but both are completely valid to use in evaluating this operational criterion. Essentially what we do in both cases is we take 
the difference of the crude minus the adjusted estimator from our regression models. And then if we're focusing on the biostat perspective, we might divide by the beta hat crude estimate. And if we're focusing on the epi perspective, we might divide by the beta hat adjusted estimate. Obviously, this will result in slightly different answers, but they generally produce similar results. And in practice, a good benchmark might be to look at a 10 or 20% change as meaningful, although it will depend on context. And so if you have some more information, that may help inform if a smaller or larger change is needed to determine confounding is present. One interesting thing to note is that there is a direct connection between the classical and operational criteria. Um, based on those three models, we can take the different estimated coefficients and we can say that our operational is defined over here by that estimate of our primary explanatory variable with the crude and the adjusted. And this will be equal to what in the classical term of confounding would be that gamma hat x and beta hat c. One important thing to note, though, why we rely on things like a quote-unquote meaningful difference is that statistical tests for confounding are generally not used. And in fact, some authors claim they are neither required nor appropriate, such as our uh, Kleinbaum et al. Uh, textbook. Indeed, the classical and operational definitions are really built in the context of a given problem to determine if something is a meaningful confounder. In addition to just identifying what may or may not be a confounder, it's useful to introduce as well some terminology for what confounding can do for different variables and different types. The first is what we call positive confounding. One definition is that it's a variable that is positively associated with both the exposure and disease, or both negatively associated. This would be a positive confounder. In other words, it goes in the same direction. Definition two is that positive confounding refers to the situation in which the effect of the confounding factor is to produce an observed estimate of the association between exposure and disease that is more extreme than the true association. In other words, with positive confounding, we're concerned that we can create spurious associations, identifying things that appear meaningful when they're in fact not actually there. This stands in contrast to the idea of negative confounding. So definition one is essentially the same idea, but instead of both being positive or both negative, they have different directions. In definition two, negative confounding refers to the situation in which the effect of the confounding factor is to produce an observed estimate of the association between our exposure and disease that is an underestimate of the true association. In other words, if we have negative confounding, we can mask the true association. So by not including that information, we may not have all the details to correctly identify the effect on our model and how the model might change with a confounder included or excluded. There are a few different ways we can address and account for confounding once we identify it or believe it to exist. One set of approaches would be that we are designing the study and we're going to use different approaches like matching, restriction, or randomization to account for confounding, with randomization being a common use in clinical trials. That's because on average, the groups will have a balance to the both known and unknown or measured and unmeasured confounders theoretically. However, if we don't happen to do any of these approaches during the design stage of our study, or we identify that we just by chance have um, imbalance, we can still look at using different approaches during the analysis, such as stratifying our results. However, the trade-off being here that if we stratify, we have smaller subsets or sample sizes within each subgroup. More realistically, in the focus of our class here would be using a regression model, adjusting for those confounders within the context of a statistical framework. So let's walk through an example of evaluating confounding based on our FEV data set. Remember there we were interested in determining if there was a difference in the lung function or that FEV measure for children who smoked and children who did not smoke. We can see that smokers in general have a higher FEV based on our little summary by statement output here from our R code. And we can also see that on average, smokers tend to be older as well. This would suggest that maybe we have positive confounding by age. We can also note that this relationship between the potential confounder um, age and the outcome FEV here 
does have this positive correlation with that Pearson correlation measure. And at 0.756, it suggests a fairly strong positive linear correlation, meaning that as people get older, their FEV tends to increase as well. So to evaluate confounding in our different frameworks and see how we might put it into practice, let's fit our three different models that we described before. We have our crude model at the top here, which only uses the primary explanatory variable or exposure of smoking as our variable of interest as a predictor. In our second model here, we have the adjusted one where we add age as that potential confounder to evaluate. And in our third model down here below, we'll look at the case where age is the outcome and we're using that exposure of smoke as our sole predictor. What we're going to leverage again is the different estimates from our model here. For example, we have our estimate of beta hat crude from the first model. In the second model, we have beta hat adjusted and beta hat sub c. And in our final model, we'll have our gamma hat sub x. So let's first start by looking at the operational criterion, and we'll look at it from the biostatistics perspective for how we calculate that. Again, we can go back to the previous slide and we can pull out that information for beta hat crude and beta hat adjusted. We'll plug it into our equation here, do the math, and we see that we have a value that is quite large. Um, in fact, we would say that age does appear to be a confounder since both beta hat crude and beta hat adjusted are not um, equivalent and their difference appears to be much greater than 20%. In fact, it is far, far above 20%, so even a more liberal threshold of 50% would still identify the operational criterion with H as a confounder. We can also, though, look at it through our classical criteria in the three different steps. So the first is asking that question, is there an association of our outcome um, with the exposure, and so, or We can also look at it from the perspective of the classical criteria and our three different measures. For example, age or con potential confounder is associated with smoking, that exposure variable or our primary explanatory variable of interest. A few ways we can look at this is the uh, rough comparison of the mean age between the smoker and non-smokers, or we could do a formal t-test to evaluate this. The second criteria would be that age is associated with our outcome FEV when we're also accounting for smoking in the model. In other words, uh, beta hat C equals 0.231 with P less than 0 0.001. The third consideration is primarily with subject matter, and so we need a little context or to speak to people who might know more, but we can hypothesize that age is probably not on the causal pathway. In other words, smoking doesn't cause age. It may cause further aging, but it won't actually change someone's time from their birth. We can also note the connection between our operational and our classical um, approaches to confounding here, where we take those coefficients for the operational, the difference of beta hat crude and beta hat adjusted for the classical gamma hat x times beta hat c. And in this case, we do see that in fact, they both equal 0.92, and so either approach using those three sets of models in different ways can get us to similar or the same conclusion. So putting it all together, we can make a few conclusions or a few points from the models we fit. The first is that from gamma hat x, that covariate model, on average, smokers are 3.99 years older than non-smokers. From our adjusted model with beta hat c, we can note that on average, for every one year increase of age, we expect FEV to increase by 0.2306 liters. And recall, because it's the adjusted model, this is accounting for the effect of smoking status. So putting it together then, we would expect FEV to be 0.9197 liters higher in smokers compared to non-smokers due to the confounding effects of age in our models and our data set. So with that, let's turn our attention to this idea of precision variables as another role a variable might play in a regression modeling framework. The term precision refers to the size of an estimator's variance or equivalently the narrowness of a confidence interval for the parameters that we're estimating. 
a more precise estimate would have a narrower confidence interval. The smaller the variance of the estimator, the higher the precision of the estimator we would have. For instance here, if we let z be some independent variable in our model, um, and we have then our outcome y and our primary explanatory variable x, we can write out the variance of our uh, beta hat from the adjusted model and beta hat for the crude model for our primary explanatory variable with this equation of correlations and partial correlations we see here. This is looking at the partial correlation between y and that independent variable z controlling for the effect of x, as well as in the correlation between x and z. However, much of this information we can actually just get straight from the regression model or the coefficient table for the variance or the standard error of our estimates. Why we're interested in precision variables is that if a strong association exists between y and that independent variable z, we would have a beneficial effect upon the precision of our estimate for beta hat adjusted for x. In other words, it'll decrease the standard error. We can note as well if there's a strong association between x and this variable z, we would have a detrimental effect on the precision of beta hat adjusted. In other words, it will increase the standard error of that uh, beta hat adjusted coefficient for our primary explanatory variable x. Thus, the precision of beta hat adjusted will reflect the competing effects of the outcome y with that independent variable z, but also then our primary explanatory variable of interest x with the independent variable z. A variable that is truly a precision variable will improve the precision of the estimate of the primary explanatory variable, or in other words, it will have more of an effect here with the strong association of y and z, overpowering the detrimental effect of a strong association between x and z. In the context of linear regression, we can note that a precision covariate is a variable that is assumed to be independent of exposure in the source of the population. In other words, gamma x would equal zero. However, we would still think it's predictive of the outcome, so beta z would not be equal to zero. In the case of the direct acyclic graph below, we see that there is no arrow between x and z. Precision covariates, therefore, by their definition, cannot be confounders based on that classical criteria we discussed earlier. Inclusion of a precision variable, though, can still be efficient or ideal because it can lead to a more efficient test and a more precise estimate of the exposure and outcome association. So to close out, let's return to our earlier example of FEV and smoking status with age in the role of a confounder. Although the classical criteria of confounding indicates that a confounder cannot be a precision variable, we can still evaluate the change in precision for smoking status by including age to see at least if it is beneficial, even if it does serve the role technically as a confounder. Going back to our regression output from earlier, we can look at the variance of beta hat adjusted and variance of beta hat crude, or the standard error estimates from our coefficient table, plug them into our formula here, squaring them because the tables give us the standard error, and we see that we have a value of 0.539. Since our ratio is less than one, we have much better precision around our estimate of beta hat adjusted by including age in the model. And since it is a confounder, we actually also accounted for some of the potential bias that might be in the model by not including age as well. However, because age is associated with our primary explanatory variable, it is a confounder instead of a precision variable. But it does still help improve the precision of our estimate. So a bit of a little uh, mind game there to play, but a role that these variables can play in a helpful way even if they're technically not serving as just exclusively a precision variable. And so with that, we'll wrap up this lecture and turn into the next lecture for a focus of mediation variables and mediation models.